Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Men Having Babies webinar on IVF clinic acquisitions, mergers, and consolidation. We're so glad that uh, we have so many people joining us here today. Um, if you have any questions as we go along through, please feel free to use the Q&A function. We'll hopefully get to um, as many questions as we can, um, hopefully keeping to our time schedule here as well. Um, if you um, don't have a question that's been addressed, you can reach us anytime, team at menhavingbabies.org. Um, and now I want to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Miller, who's going to say a few words um, before we jump right in. Thanks, Lisa. We are thrilled to have you guys here today. So just quickly to go through the agenda, um, we want to make sure that we call out and highlight our impact partners. Um, a quick reminder that we have 2023 conference registrations open and quickly filling up. And then the main event, what you are here for is to hear from these providers um, and go through that moderated discussion. And then like Lisa said, we will take your questions at the end. So moving right along, our 2022 impact partners whom we are so, so grateful for. These are providers and organizations who really believe in our mission and what we are doing. And um, we had Braun join as our very first one several months back, and we've added a couple to the list. We have Seed Trust and Pinnacle and Cryoport, and we're so thankful for their support. And um, we couldn't do what we do um, without having support from providers like them. So looking forward to 2023, um, we are going to be in seven different cities this coming year, starting with Taipei, San Francisco, Berlin, which is our new European conference that we have not done this before in the past. So 2023 will be our first time there. And then we'll be in Chicago, New York, Fort Lauderdale and Brussels. Registration opened yesterday and we uh, only have a handful of spots left in both Taipei and Berlin already. So if you are thinking about joining us, now is really the time to, to make that commitment and jump right in. I know we will see a lot of you at the end of this fall or at the end of this um, year in the fall already for the rest of our 2022 events. Um, those are sold out right now, but we're really excited to, to see you soon. So. Registration opened, first come, first serve, so get those in. And remember, you do get discounts off of your conference sponsorship fees if you are joining us for Stage 2 GPAP, if you have a Stage 2 GPAP pledge. Any questions you have, you can always reach me, sarah at menhavingbabies.org, or the team email address. And right there is the link that you can use to sponsor. So with that said, we will jump into the reason you guys are all here today. Ron, I'll hey. oh, let, let me yeah. hold on just a second. So I need to introduce you guys all know Ron Pool Diane, MHB's executive director, and Dr. Doyle, um, and what a physician and a board member, both very instrumental in the work we do here today. And they are going to skillfully take you through this discussion with Pinnacle and IV and US fertility and kind body today and address your questions at the end. So now I will actually pass it off to the two of you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and uh, thank you for the entire MHB team. It's a, it's a terrific team. We couldn't do everything uh, that we've been able to do for intended parents uh, in advocacy, in uh, our work with the professional community without them. And uh, stay tuned, we're, uh, you know, we're announcing a new hire soon. So uh, our, at our 10th anniversary, we were actually reaching uh, a, a staff of 10. So uh, that's uh, uh, very uh, symbolic. Um, we uh, have a really amazing, distinguished list of speakers here today. And I thank them uh, in advance for their time. Um, anybody that's uh, in this field uh, knows that uh, things have been brewing and being announced and are happening in the last at least year, you know, definitely uh, longer than that, as far as at least some of the brewing in the uh, IVF uh, field. And um, we have an advisory board uh, uh, that uh, we kind of like, you know, like to other than uh, get input for uh, planning, but also run uh, some of these topics by them. And we were uh, wondering um, how this all is going to impact the surrogacy field in particular. Uh, surrogacy is a very, and third party uh, reproductive uh, uh, technology and surrogacy in particular is a very uh, specialized sub uh, uh, field of IVF that requires even more moving parts than uh, you know, the other infertility treatments, uh, if I may say so, and have 
typically involves uh, patients who are outside the geographical area of these clinics. And a lot of the clinics that are very active in surrogacy are now being merged, acquired, uh, benefiting from investments, et cetera. And since there are a lot of uh, sector partners or, or you know, partners in the field that are uh, dependent and, and appreciative of these uh, uh, clinics, we knew that uh, they, along us, would be interested in understanding more about what's happening, what we can expect, um, and maybe have a dialogue about uh, how this transition is going to be going through. So uh, let me just start by saying that part of the, re just to emphasize or to kind of like, you know, drive through part of the reason why this is important also for the intended parents uh, who are, you know, typically not that familiar with what's happening in the field in general, is that one of the things that we're coming across uh, and now we're doing it uh, uh, more so in the context of Surrogacy Advisor, which is a, a collaborative uh, uh, venture we're doing with SEEDS uh, to be launched in a, a couple of months, I hope. Uh, you'll hear much more about it. Um, that we're trying to figure out, you know, how to present all of these to prospective parents. And, and with mergers, acquisitions, so, so, several times, also including brand uh, 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 realignments, the question is what constitute a clinic for the intended parents, for the prospective parents? And uh, we have defined along with a, a group of, uh, you know, with a committee of advisors uh, that what, what we will allow a clinic to present itself as a, uh, as a, a multiple clinics to present themselves as a single entity if they first and foremost report their, res their results together to SART and CDC, namely that they share one mass ID, for those of you who are familiar with the term, uh, which typically also means a lot more than that. But beyond that, of course, and somewhat embedded already in the above, is that they are known uh, by a, a mutual name, uh, that they share a common pricing scheme. We think that it'll be not okay for an intended parent to go online and see a particular brand or a particular clinic. And then when they enter a certain facility and say, the pricing you, heard, you saw online is the other facility, not us. Uh, that they share a unified appointment system, uh, that they don't have facilities that are so far apart that they could obviously not share uh, the medical resources, including a lab and in, our, in this case, 50 miles apart. So, when those mergers occur, we just want to say that, among other things, the question is who's who, and is if uh, uh, a particular corporate entity has a hundred locations around the country, are they all the same clinic? Uh, and that's just one of many, many implications of why we want to try to decipher and understand more uh, how the field might be transformed. So with that, so we'll come back in a few minutes without uh, um, uh, any more introduc comments introductory, we will start with Pinnacle uh, and we will hear from four uh, groups today, as I mentioned. So uh, Pinnacle will be the first, US Fertility will be second, Ivy Fertility third and Kind Body Vios uh, the fourth. So please, uh, Dr. Ringler and uh, the CEO of Pinnacle, uh, Andrew Mintz, please uh, turn your uh, uh, video on and uh, please uh, let us know a little more about your um, new uh, group. Fantastic. Thank you, Ron. Um, my name is Andrew Mintz. I'm the CEO of Pinnacle Fertility. Um, our mission is to fulfill dreams by building families, which is probably similar to what most of you have. Our, our vision is really a four-pronged approach. So one is setting the standard of fertility care, looking at uh, our quality outcomes, offering comprehensive and personalized services, um, using advanced processes and technologies, and creating an inclusive environment which people want to work. And to that end, we also have our value statements here to the right. Our, uh, these are our values. Um, and we have an organizational compact that talks about behaviors that are consistent with our, with our values. We are made up of several different clinics uh, we currently have seven clinics in the Pinnacle Network. We have uh, three more that are closing uh, in the next, uh, uh, this week, one last week and two this week. Um, and so you'll be hearing more about that. 
Uh, in total, we will have about 44 physicians do over 15,000 cycles. Uh, we do of the 15,000 cycles, almost a thousand of them are third party cycles, both for domestic and international patients. And we currently span uh, multiple states, uh, most of which are friendly to women's health and some of them which are turning less um, friendly towards women's health rights. Um, we build our strategic plans, uh, both from an organizational perspective as well as a clinic perspective, um, and they tie into it, into that, and this is the process we go through. Uh, we do have five uh, strategies within uh, Pinnacle, um, and the next slide, uh, it talks about uh, our operational excellence and integration of our practices, to bring those practices into um, the uh, pinnacle set of systems and processes. Um, we look at market share uh, within each of the markets. And we look at the ancillary services that we want to both um, provide internally as well as partner externally, which we'll talk about in a second. We have a quality goal for the organization and consistent with our, our vision, we also have a very specific goal for developing a healthy culture for our employees. The ancillary services are um, around here. Some of these that we currently um, own and operate and some of these we are partnering and in some of these we are doing uh, both. So we own our own uh, fertility pharmacy uh, within our network. Uh, we have a significant uh, international presence uh, with our practices specifically in Oregon and in Southern California. Um, we also have our own uh, genetic strategy uh, and we partnered with iGenomics and are looking at other options. Um, we also have internally some surrogacy and egg banking capabilities and are talking to several partners about helping us with that thousand year, thousand per year uh, third party journey uh, that we need. We're also uh, looking at our financing and multi-cycle pricing programs so we'll have our own consumer lending arm as well um, that will uh, be working side by side with other partners that we have and looking at multi-cycle pricing specifically around a third party and, uh, and uh, targeting both domestic and international patients. And lastly, we need to be addressing uh, long-term storage for our specimens into a central location. Uh, we do that through a series of uh, collaborative uh, um, ventures that we've got, again, consistent with our values. So we have a medical director council made up of a physician from each of our practices that are looking at how to reduce the variation in care on the clinical side. We have our lab director council that's doing the same thing on the, uh, the uh, scientific side. And then we have our practice leader council are reporting up to our COO to also reduce variations in our systems and operational processes within our clinics. I think all of us and yeah, thank you, Andrew. All of us in third party reproduction know that it really does take a village to help our patients build their families. I've been doing this for 25 years, helping men to have babies and build their families. And I've worked closely with many of the surrogacy agencies, egg donor agencies, reproductive attorneys. And through our association with Pinnacle, we will work to strengthen our relationships with our industry partners so we can expand and improve patient outcomes and make their patient building experiences more positive. We will promote um, high ethical medical standards that we'll share with our partners. We want, we believe in transparency and education for all patients. And we believe by having these close working relationships with our partners, we'll ultimately simplify the process for patients, making the coordination better, faster, smoother journeys, all adding up to better outcomes is what, what we all want. We all wanna work closely with our partners to help make the patient experience um, smooth and positive for them. Next slide. Yeah, you know, as as I mentioned, I've been I've been working with um, gay men, lesbian women, helping them to build families for nearly thirty years, and my colleagues at ORM an equally long period of time. And 
we've demonstrated our commitment to the LGBTQ community. And in our association with Pinnacle, they've been very supportive of this commitment. Um, and they have an inclusive employee environment, inclusive patient environment, um, partnership with members uh, in the community, LGBT community. Um, they're very export, uh, supportive of third party reproduction. And we wanna make the process simplified and positive and ultimately successful for our patients. Um, Love is Family is a website platform initiated by ORM that has transitioned over to, to become the pinnacle um, LGBTQ platform where patients can go to find out information about the treatment processes involved in third party reproduction, hear patient testimonials. Um, so I think it will be a very positive place for patients to go to explore. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew and uh, Dr. Ringler. Uh, this has been uh, extremely uh, insightful. And as I mentioned before, we will get back uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, to ask you and the other participants uh, several uh, specific questions uh, that we think are going to be of interest uh, for the audience. So, so thank you for your introductory remarks. And uh, we will now hear from two uh, of representative from U.S. Fertility. So, uh, yeah, Josh, if you can, uh, Joshua, if you can uh, turn on your camera as well. And uh, we uh, know you. We know a lot of the clinics associated with you, like Fertility Center of Illinois, IVF Florida, uh, Shady Grove, etc. So, please uh, let us know uh, more about uh, U.S. Fertility. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Josh Safe. Ron, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to meet with this group. And I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Anish Shaw as well, who's part of the, both the USF leadership team as well as uh, a clinician at Shady Grove in Virginia. So what I thought I'd do to start out with is give you a little bit of an overview of what USF is, uh, what our platform looks like, and some of our mission and strategy uh, in terms of how we address uh, some of the opportunities that we see today. So uh, as Ron mentioned, USF is comprised of four founding practices, right? Uh, the, the four practices are Shady Grove Fertility, uh, Fertility Center of Illinois, uh, outside of Chicago, IVF Florida and South Florida, and RS uh, Reproductive Science Center in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, we look at ourselves as one of the leading uh, overall national platforms and networks of fertility, uh, fertility services, uh, including actually an international component with our Chilean operations. Uh, we have over 100 physicians across the country. We represent about 11 states. Uh, and uh, as of last year, we're already on track to uh, uh, do over 19,000 annualized cycles per year. Uh, our location and our footprint, we look at as, uh, you know, second to none in terms of covering the U.S. And I think there has, uh, th that presents a number of potential opportunities and benefits to patients about having that scale. So as we think about what our strategy really is, uh, we're really focused on some of the higher level lodestones, such as uh, improving patient care and outcomes, obviously delivering world-class outcomes, better best-in-class patient care is number one. Uh, that's our whole focus. We are a doctor and physician-led organization with that at the core of our mission. And um, everything we do is really designed uh, to enhance and improve upon that. Uh, at the same time, we're constantly looking to improve patient care and the patient experience. Um, and we believe that uh, so the investments we're making, as well as the scale that we've achieved, uh, really allows us to do this. And by, it, that's done by virtue of our ability to reinvest into the platform. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're able to reinvest in uh, and, and take some of the uh, some of the scale that we've achieved, put into research, into patient access, into training, uh, into financial options and and uh, and guarantees for our patients, and to really invest in clinical and financial teams that focus on the individualized uh, patient care in each situation individually. Right? Those resources really allow us to do that at the patient level um, and, and across the network. Um, you can see some of the statistics here, which I won't read off, but you know, what we're able to do is really bring together this network of physicians. There's clinical collaboration, there's the ability to service the third party uh, and gestational carrier surrogacy uh, needs of our patients. Um, and whatever our patients, uh, wherever their needs sit, we're able to do that. And at the same time, investing in the communities that we serve, all of our practices uh, are completely uh, clinically autonomous, right? 
from a business standpoint, what we seek to do at the business side uh, is really leverage some of the efficiencies to create the opportunity to invest the way we do, to drive that clinical efficiency, to drive that those clinical outcomes and bring best in class practices across the network while creating an opportunity for the clinicians to collaborate. So that's really what we're all about. I mean, um, you can see here we're over 2000 employees and I'll turn this over to Anish in a moment. Um, this is some of the examples we have of, of the ways we're investing in innovation and research. Um, so Anish, I want to turn it over to you for a moment. Yeah, well, thank you, Josh. Um, you know, really, I, I'm a physician within Shady Grove, within U.S. Fertility, been with the practice for uh, about a decade now. And, and for us, it's really important to focus on when we talk about best in class, best in service, trying to make sure that we're always propelling this field forward to improve clinical care it means that you have to focus on education and research. Um, and we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. And from that means, you know, we participate in our, our, our society, American Society for Reproductive Medicine. But in addition, uh, you know, last year we had 30 papers shown at ASRM. We've had, we have multiple papers annually that are published. We're the most published uh, network uh, currently within the United States and North America. Um, a lot of our members participate on some of the standard of care for uh, practice guidelines to writing those guidelines. And, you know, there are 44 uh, current programs that educate uh, new physicians to become uh, fel uh, fertility physicians. Uh, we call them fellowships, and they're usually about three to four years, three years of additional training after uh, OBGYN training, which is about four years uh, post-medical school. And of those, we, we help participate in the NIH fellowship training, Eastern Virginia Medical School, Jones Institute, which was the first fellowship program in the country, um, U uh, University of Southern Florida, and University of Colorado. And we're adding actually a few others. And, and so what we do with that is if we don't learn to try to understand how to do better in our field, we cannot make it better. And so if we can do the things from a business platform that Josh provides by making sure we're metricing all of our quality scores and quality indicators and making sure our 16 labs are functioning in the highest level, then we have to also make sure that we are educating the future of our field and also trying to propel that research to stay cutting edge. And so for us, that's been a really strong commitment so that we can achieve higher live birth rates per, uh, per transfer. And that means it's cheaper for you, cheaper for everyone, less heartache and better outcomes. And that's, that's kind of our focus. Uh, and it's been a great, exciting uh, birth as U.S. Fertility moves forward. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Shah and Joshua. Uh, this is, uh, once again, very, very insightful. Uh, next, we have with us uh, Lisa Vandoff, uh, the CEO of Ivy Fertility, uh, have been with San Diego Fertility for many years, and Dr. Say Danishman uh, from uh, San Diego Fertility. Please let us know, tell us more about uh, Ivy Fertility. Thank you. I'm going to get started and pass the baton just to Dr. Donishman. Um, first of all, I want to thank Men Having Babies uh, for gathering us today. This is a very important conversation, and I'm sure um, you know you articulated some concerns. I think you'll see by the end of this discussion that each of us, um, my colleagues and myself, are committed to uh, our growth, um, and, and none of this is meant to be scary or frightening, but great opportunity for each of us to do the things that we believe um, we're capable of and can do better together. So. I have the opportunity to introduce you to Ivy Fertility, a um, very exciting time in our lives. And um, Ivy um, is probably the, the youngest one on the, on the block, um, but we have uh, locations um, in six states, um, about 30 embryologists, I mean, endocrinologists. Um, and I would be um, uh, disappointed not to mention each of them. Um, I think you'll know our physicians and our physicians are, are very central to who we are and what we're going to be as we grow. So um, San Diego Fertility Center, you know, Dr. Saeed Donishman, Susanna Park, uh, Sandy Chuan, Michael Kettle, and Brooke Freeman. Um, we have reproductive partners 
in Los Angeles with Andy Wong, Diane Abbasuthian, uh, Carrie Wambach, Marley Amin, Wayne Lynn, uh, Amy Kang, Greg Rosen. Um, we have Nevada Fertility Center with Russell Folk and Kurt Russell. We have Utah Fertility Center, Russell Folk, Deirdre Conway, Sean Griffith, Jason Parker, and Jesse Dureas, Scott Witten in Reno, and then with our addition of Pacific Northwest, uh, Lori Marshall, Laura Shaheem, Julie Lamb, uh, Julie Broughton, uh, I mean, Ju yeah, Ju uh, Darcy Broughton, Stephanie Rothenberg, and in Los Angeles, we just added Nareet Winkler and Mark Callen at Los Angeles Reproductive Center. So a great group of esteemed physicians. Um, we're excited to be together. We have some great aspirations and a lot of commitment to our um, already um, lengthy experience with um, third-party reproduction, um, both in the U.S. and internationally. So um, it's with great pleasure to introduce Saeed Danishman, and I'll let him tell you um, what we have in store for ourselves. Thank you so much, Lisa. And it's, it's really an honor to be here among uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, my friends. And really what I wanted to just add was that the genesis of um, our sort of uh, partnership uh, in Ivy was, I was talking to one of my very good friends, Dr. Andy Wong in Los Angeles. And we talked about how wonderful it would be to bring a group of like-minded physicians, bring a think tank together so that we can collaborate. Uh, we can innovate, we can increase access uh, for intended parents, so we can do more monitoring for egg donors and surrogates in different states. And there, there sort of in lies the, the genesis of, of the sort of the Ivy uh, group of centers. And we did that, um, and it's been almost a year and a half uh, since we sort of culminated that particular um, investment. And really what I wanted to do is, is, is kind of highlight a few of the um, great elements of this particular partnership. For example, um, in the space of innovation, what we wanna do is we wanna increase access for intended parents. So they're able to reach the physician that they wanna to speak to easier. So with you know, the digital innovation that's gone on, uh, with the app, apps that you have, pay, intended parents will be able to easily find their way into appointments. Um, surrogates will find an easier way to have appointments at fertility centers. We'll be able to better coordinate surrogacy uh, monitoring, egg donor monitoring. That's one area. The second area is, and one of my colleagues alluded to this, is by pooling our resources, we can actually lower the cost of um, the surrogacy journey. How do we lower the cost? Well, we, one area would be pooling resources in terms of medications. We can actually decrease the cost of infertility medications, which are very expensive, by pooling resources. And we've been able to do that uh, as well. The third area is, you know, I, I've been in practice for about 24 plus years, and research has been sort of an integral part of my career. We've published really some sentinel papers on endometrial receptivity, uh, on uh, fresh versus frozen embryo transfers. And so uh, what, by pooling our resources, we're now actually increasing the data that we have. For example, in the upcoming American Society of Reproductive Medicine Conference, we have actually two important papers, one of them up for a prize paper, looking at egg donor, uh, egg donors and their perception of donation, what motivates them to donate, what are some of the um, feedback that they typically have after they go through a an egg, don egg donation process in a particular fertility center, what makes them come back, what encourages them to come back, what, how do we better serve our egg donors? We have another uh, paper as well, looking at, for example, genetic analysis, and we're looking at the family history of intended parents, the family history of egg donors, looking at how we can enhance that particular analysis so that we can guide our intended parents, we can guide uh, there are donors in terms of what are some of the risks of transmission of genetic diseases. You know, the, the third area is monitoring, and we alluded to this. In, now, nowadays, um, you know, for the past couple of years, we have had the ability to have egg donors and surrogates monitored with our colleagues, with our trusted colleagues. So that's another advantage. In fact, we actually proved the, the sort of the, the, this particular thesis during the pandemic when when I reached out to many of my colleagues, trusted colleagues in Europe, and we were able to actually advance the, the journeys of many intended parents, despite the fact that they had 
impediments to coming to the United States. But when all is said and done, what's really important is to preserve the culture that we've established because our reputation, the way we've treated intended parents and egg donors and surrogates, the way we've, we've taken the taken care of them is really the, the key component of what's built our reputation and what makes us successful. We have referrals from our trusted colleagues, from, from egg donor agencies, from surrogacy agencies, from all of you, because we take good care of patients. So we are preserving that culture. Each particular center remains independent. There's no uh, plan for centralization of services. Each particular center is independent. Each, each particular physician is independent. So that personal connection with our intended parents, with our surrogates, with all of you, our trusted colleagues, will not change. And, and they will not change until my last breath because that's what makes us who we are. You know, two years ago, every surrogate, every intended parent had access to, to my cell phone. They would communicate with me via text, via email. I'm always available. And that has not changed. Available to my colleagues and available to the intended parents making that experience a real personal one. Because yes, the fear is, and when you have these mergers and acquisitions, that revenue and profit become sort of top of mind. And that's the only thing that matters. Actually, what makes really good business sense is to take good care of your patients, to always be available to them, to take good care of your colleagues, always be available to them. And ultimately, that's going to make the big, uh, best big business sense. So I'm here to tell you that the, the investments that we've made are going to just enhance access. We're going to continue to augment our support of organizations such as Men Having Babies because they also increase access for intended parents. And uh, it's something that I'm very passionate about and uh, would love to talk about. And it was just something that Ron and I talked about in San Francisco. Uh, and I felt uh, it was really important to bring this message to all of you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Saeed was uh, referencing the advisory board uh, uh, session where this uh, came up first. And uh, we are very uh, pleased now to welcome Dr. Uh, Angie Beltas from uh, originally Vios, now Kind Body Vios. And please let us uh, tell us more about uh, what you're up to. Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, giving us a chance to share uh, an update on where the field has gotten and all of our new relationships uh, that have developed. And at Kind Body, um, our vision, of course, very similarly is um, helping people have a family. Next slide. We um, found uh, on the business side that there are three things that are critically important in healthcare, the patient experience, outcome, and cost. Um, next slide. Um, and I think when you bring all those together, we have uniquely positioned the consumer brand, a powerful brand, along with um, technology and creating that proprietary EMR and portal really facilitates communication. And then, of course, having um, a, an incredible group of providers to help with that. Next slide. So on the the business side of this, we've seen um, that many of the things that happen are happening by increasing access to care. We see um, different states adopting uh, the mandates, which is very exciting. Um, and if we look over the different fields, we do see that the fertility industry over the years and 08, 09, and now coming into this again, that it does seem to be relatively stable in spite of impacts such as recession. Um, next slide. And so who are we? We uh, started Vios in 2015, um, Kind Body in 2018, and together how what we've done is created an organization that allows for employer um, benefits to be driven, um, driving some of what we do. Um, that allows also for improvement in what the business can look like in regards to margins. And uh, we will be 34 clinics and also have um, capital that's been raised uh, as we started. Next slide. I think one of the 
interesting developments that we see is that does fertility was not considered um, anything that was a condition or a disease. And here with the um, development of uh, coverage and carve out approaches, I think what we are seeing now is um, a full spectrum and opportunities for infertility, but also for um, direct contracting has allowed for coverage for those um, and the LGBTQI community, which I think will be very um, impacted by these relationships that are being uh, developed with directly with the employers. Next slide. So I think the incredible forces, we are very blessed in the United States to have the the providers that we've listened to thus far. And what makes Kind Body unique um, is, again, this uh, bringing together of provision of care, the technology and innovation, transparent um, pricing, and then, of course, clinical excellence, including our Kind EOS. Next slide. Our locations are throughout the United States, and I think this is very important because we do like to centralize some of what we're doing to allow nimbleness and tight communication through similar EMRs and technology, and so that when people do monitor, it's one system. There are 34 locations um, by the end of this year and more to come um, in the next year. Next slide. So people ask about what this merger of Vios and Kind Body has allowed for, and I think that we are very um, came together with two like-minded teams, and now we are over forty REI physicians, which again have this benefit of incredible clinical care um, technology that is really on the forefront, as well as our own vertical integration of third party, and then a very big commitment and deep commitment to LGBTQI and men having babies. Next slide. Um, our own um, kind EOS is EOS Conception, which um, is actually stands for the dawn of a new day um, with embryos, oocytes, and surrogacy. We have our own egg bank, um, and we also work with our partners in the in the country and in the world where patients may find that they're going to use um, a different program. Both are equally uh, fine with us. Um, we also have embryo donation. We stand behind our word and uh, we do have the guarantee programs that allow for baby or the money back as well as payment plans. But this exclusive employer benefit that is not only national, but international where we will um, have relationships with employers that allow for benefits to go directly to our patients, even for surrogacy coverage. Um, and of course, being part of Ron's uh, incredible creative mind of creating programs like GPAP and um, other programs that assist our patients. Next slide. Um, I'll, we have a number of REI physicians um, and they are located throughout the country. Um, next slide. Um, and we also have um, GYN that assists in your patient care. Maybe your surrogate would be um, receiving their obstetrical care and, and that sort of thing in the beginning with our team. Next slide. And uh, we have exclusive arrangements with companies like Disney where um, they have their own kind body IVF lab. Next slide. Um, and a list um, here of other providers that your patients may interact with, which include our advanced practice providers as well. Next slide. Um, our executive team um, includes Gina Bartesi, who um, founded Kind Body and is the chair of the board. Anne Beth is our CEO corporate. Um, I am the CEO of all the clinical uh, endeavors and Greg Poulos, the president. Next slide. Um, the clinical leadership is also very important with um, who guides the clinical aspects, and they are together um, extremely important. We do have academic 
um, positions too, because we do feel that providing um, research back to the field is incredibly important. Uh, we have now the uh, relationship with Wayne State University, and um, I am the division uh, head for reproductive endocrine, and we will be um, reapplying for the fellowship, but Ruhi is part of our clinical re research. Next slide. And we're back to Ron. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, this has been really, really very insightful. Uh, we're going to turn off the uh, slideshow now. And um, I would like to ask all the panelists uh, to come back on. Uh, that you can turn on your cameras so we have the full view of uh, this um, amazing group. And uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, you know, given the, the introductions you already provided, is ask you a few questions. And my first question, I'm kind of going to combine two questions in it, because I think generally speaking, we all know and uh, that what you're doing is probably a very difficult balancing act. Uh, there are you know, ambitions for more uh, efficiencies, centralizing, uh, standardizing, uh, expand, expanding. Uh, those are, you know, some of the um, general themes uh, in your uh, visions. And on the other hand, there's the fear of, uh, there's potentially could be other uh, risk, but at the very least, how can you not be overwhelmed for a period of time such that the transition um, is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, taking too much of your resources and it's hard to continue with the care that you've been providing before. So first of all, if you can address how ambitious are your centralizing, your efficiency, et cetera, is there a particular, you know, pace that you want to try to set and how do you think you'll be able to avoid the pitfall of uh, a significant uh, disruption during that period. And we will go at, at the same order as we started. So uh, Andrew, if you wanna take that or somebody from Pinnacle first, and then uh, we'll go US, US Fertility, uh, Ivy, and then Kind Body. Sure, so um, we are, uh, uh, I, as I said before, reducing variation in both the uh, process and systems within the organization. So. We convert everyone onto the same electronic health record. Um, we have uh, created standards in our lab. Uh, we've created our own embryology school to train embryologists um, using uh, uh, our, our processes. Uh, we have an internal uh, QA person within our uh, lab council who goes around and making sure that people are following the process systems uh, and quality standards as set uh, by the council. So, uh, and we are um, implementing similar operational models across the board. So we believe that there are efficiencies that we can use, uh, systems and technologies that we can use um, and allows us to build sort of a consistent culture. So all that is consistent with the uh, vision of our organization. Ron, I can tell you that as a clinician on a day-to-day -day basis, things are not changing, except I have the added benefit that I've not now have colleagues that, you know, I used to call competitors, competitors. Now I call my partners, you know. And so it's it's a wonderful dialogue. Uh, we're able to exchange. And I love Saeed's comment about the importance of providing good care and everything else falls into place. And that's 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 our goal, that's our mission. Provide the best patient care, attentive. A receptive, um, do the best you can. And now we have a team of, of um, new partners that I can ask questions to. They text, text me, Guy, what do you think about this? So it will all help to improve outcomes. Uh, Josh, you want, uh, some, uh, or uh, Anish, one of you? Yeah, sure. We're happy. I think it's a good question, right? And I think, you know, the appearance of there being a natural tension, um, I, I actually don't necessarily think we would entirely agree with that premise, right? In terms of the dissonance between the two, you know, where we see the integration really focused, uh, and this is part, and mostly by design, really is on the operational side, right? So on the clinical side, the autonomy, the independence, and the benefit of the collaboration is what we see as a lot of the benefits of joining and creating that scale and benefiting from you know what we what we've been able to invest in, in terms of you know obviously there's some you know change always has some friction there's some change uh, you know but a lot of that is not on the physicians by design 
you know, we think about where do we centralize? It's in the areas where it makes sense, where we can drive efficiencies that actually support the clinical mission, the outcomes and the access. So things like finance, revenue cycle management, contracting, information technology, human resources, all of the general corporate functions. One, you know, one of the goals we have is we bring smaller practices into our network is to free up the clinicians from a lot of the burdens that they might have as part of a smaller practice so that they can focus on patient care, right? And, you know, we've been, this is not new to us. I mean, we've been doing this, uh, USF's a relatively new organization, but its predecessors and, and our, you know, the component practices have been doing this for 20 plus years. So, you know, it's not to say we're perfect, we're not, we make mistakes, every case is unique, but we've, we've paid our tuition, if you will, on a lot of the, you know, learning uh, from our mistakes and you know, getting better over time. Uh, and what I, what I always say is that if we don't critically look at a situation, learn from it, understand it, and see what we can do to make it better, then you're never going to improve. Change is important. Change is critical. And as an organization, we've been growing since 2006 when we first did our first M merger to include the Baltimore location, subsequently adding on further locations uh, on the East Coast. And you know, ultimately, our footprint is you know 100 and something uh, strong physicians. And part of that was each time we do a new location and um, uh, add a practice on, we look and we download what has been working, what's not working. And we have an integration team that's dedicated to this. And we have a binder that kind of works through that. And what we try to do is make sure that that process moves through trial and error uh, through the years as smooth as possible. Our electronic systems have to improve with every year, every, you know, this is where U.S. Fertility excels is making sure that if you have a patient that, uh, you know, is seen in, um, in, in our location in Manhattan, that they're able to be uh, seen by, uh, be the primary physician in Texas. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot of this through our specialty division and um, our international division, because we provide all the donor services for egg for a lot of the uh, Canadian and England uh, locations, uh, that's been helpful for us to understand how can we integrate and help uh, uh, practices that are far and, and use and leverage uh, electronic systems to provide better care. The other thing that we've done- If, if we can maybe perhaps uh, move on to the next group, I, I will, if possible to keep the answers to a couple of minutes each, just because it will compound and uh, we might not be able to go through our entire agenda. So uh, uh, is that okay? Thank you. Uh, Ivy, uh, uh, any co comments about that particular, this round before we? I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump in because I have to go to an egg retrieval just in a few minutes, but just, I think if you could make your sing singular focus, the care of your patients. And I remember when I was uh, graduating um, from residency and fellowship, I asked one of my professors, I said, what's, what's, the, what's the key to a successful practice? And he said, you just put your head down, you, you, you pull up your sleeves and you take excellent care of your patients. So if you can make that the singular focus and you resist the temptation of other factors, um, you know, maximizing profits, those kinds of things, if you do that, that actually not only is the best for the patients we take care of, the intended parents, the surrogates, but it actually makes the best business sense as well. So that's the singular focus. Now, added, you add texture to that. And as my colleagues talked about is innovation, um, using the latest technologies to increase access, uh, monitoring, research, all of that. That adds texture, enriches the intended parents experience, the surrogates experience. But the singular focus has, has to always be an incredible relationship, communication, availability to intended parents and surrogates and to our colleagues who really are responsible for why we're here. Because if we don't have that, then we don't have success. So to me, that's that's the most important factor. And I think Lisa can, can add to that whilst I um, head to a retrieval. Uh, yeah. oh, okay, uh, Dr. Beltis? Your question included centralization. And I think that there are very important features of centralization because it brings the team together in standard operating procedures, um, creates, uh, it 
an acceptance of what the um, treatment will be at a certain level. So I think that's really important. It creates nimbleness. It allows for cross coverage and everyone's speaking the same language. So I think that that can be very important while continuing to maintain that individualized care. So not as rigid and structured um, as we would say would remove that but actually accentuate and improve the, the ultimate goal, which is to help them um, have a family. I think uh, one of your things was ambition of change and um, being able to avoid these pitfalls of disruption. So you're kind of flying the plane and building the plane at the same time while the organization is, is growing and coming together. And whenever there is change, there's always, and the shift, the ship, is shifting a bit, there's always a little turbulence that's created. So I think there are two incredible important elements. Number one, maintain the culture and your vision, which as Syed has eloquently said, is remember that it's always about the patient first. And then second is do create process, process that um, everyone is educated on. And like Nelson Mandela said, the most powerful way to change the world is education. So we strongly believe in that as well. Uh, I want to move to the next question, but Lisa, did you want to add something before? Did I skip you or... No, Angie did a beautiful job. I, I was just going to comment to say that, you know, it, we're all working towards the same common goal here, which is to provide absolute best care to our patients and coming together really serves in that role. And we can divide and conquer. And some of us have the responsibility of supporting that process and others in delivering that service. So thank you. Michael. Well, I think one of the questions that comes next has been eloquently answered. So across the panel, which addressed the concern that many of the providers have shared with us, which is, you know, these are phenomenal physicians whose reputations over the years have been based on doing personalized and highly authentic work one-on-one -on -one with patients. And now they're in a transition. And the concern and question has, has been, is there any reason to expect that with this reorganization, there'll be some kind of shift in core values or the personalization of care you know, that, that have made these physicians so beloved over the years. And I'm not even sure I wanna ask that question because I think literally each of you has already addressed that in a way that I hope makes our providers feel well. And in addition, even Lisa mentioned physicians are central and Andrew mentioned that patients come first. So I, I, I hope one of the take homes from this session is the fact that it, it, along with this change, which I know from some of the providers in the audience, uh, uh, leads lends themselves to some concern. Is there a potential potential for remarkable collaboration and progress? That said, I, I do want to ask a tangential question, which is given the added connections that these uh, relationships bring, and the resources, and presumably the profit margin. Um, Physicians over the years and nurses have always been committed to not only caring for their patients, but for their communities as well. As well. And um, I think now more than ever, we know that in our community, advocacy and uh, supporting social missions has probably never become more important. So I wonder whether from these collaborations and partnerships and re reforming of, of new agendas and, and new missions on top of the ones that you've also eloquently articulated, we might expect to see some element um, that's been lacking, I think, so far in energy, which is the giving back part of it, the, the, the extended focus on social causes, uh, advocacy, protecting uh, reproductive rights and access to care. And that, that goes beyond some of the things that I think if you've mentioned in your slides, which are refunds and patient-friendly pricing, but sort of more on a community global and ethical level, whether these mergers may provide us an opportunity to actually lead the way in medicine uh, and show the rest of our colleagues you know, what we're really capable of doing as a team. I can certainly start with that. Um, from the Pinnacle perspective, we actually have uh, a, a mandate from our board that a certain percentage of our revenue board goes towards environmental, social and governance um, uh, initiatives within um, the communities that we serve. So it's not just about promoting diversity, it's about improving the uh, earth 
um, and improving the environment under which people live. So yes, we are actually um, have a whole set of initiatives around um, making this a, a, a better uh, place for people to live um, that, so that don't necessarily just surround the fertility piece of it, but also making sure we're reducing our carbon footprint and that we're more inclusive um, in terms of representation and, um, and, uh, and focus uh, of our patient care. Uh, Josh? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Guy. From a US fertility standpoint, you know, um, I think that all of us, one of, the, one of the most important factors for all the networks here is that by aggregating all the physicians together, we unite behind such an important cause like women's rights, uh, access to care and diversity and supporting all communities. And, um, and for us, one of the leaps for US fertility when it organized and formed was to take uh, that opportunity and really focus there and try to, um, try to really push that agenda outward, especially right now in this point in time. And so um, I think that we all have this opportunity and I hope every network um, takes the moment and tries to organize and we, we collaborate. Uh, because at the net goal is that if we support and we are organized like we are in the clinical side and the outcomes and, and all of those, when I hear everyone, the themes are very good and they're very common and it's exciting to hear that. But this question is probably the most important um, in my heart right now because of the evolution of where we are in our society. And so uh, I, I, I believe and I hope that everyone is working towards that goal. Um, and, and at US Fertility, through our, our uh, Diversity Inclusion Committee uh, and Ben, Dr. Harris, uh, we're, we're spearheading that in all of our local uh, uh, team support members for diversity inclusion. So Dr. Doyle, you're very inspirational in your speaking, but I think that all of us um, agree 100%. And um, you know, the, the benefit of the of the aggregation of these practices that were once fairly fragmented and operating in very kind of local geographic regions now have the time and bandwidth and the opportunity to contribute together. And you know, IED's made a, a cons, you know very detailed uh, commitment in the budget for these kind of efforts as well. And you know, our work with men having babies over the years, I think, can just be you know built on along with Resolve and other you know advocacy groups that we can align with together. So it's exciting. Um, sometimes change brings about um, great things. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and I would say that one of the things that became very um, attractive to me personally was the idea of democratizing the care of our patients, no matter what their story and no matter where they wanted to land, whether they wanted to be parents today or tomorrow, that access to care. And I think you bring up an important point, um, philanthropy advocacy, um, education, all of those are important. And using resources, resources of time, resource, resources of a team and financial. So I think all of those become critically important in our, in our responsibility to stand on the shoulders of giants that did that before us, that allowed us to get to here. And I think that's really important giving back to and giving forward. Wonderful. And, and, and as you know, there's so much uh, that could be done. I mean, we, we started uh, really pushing forward uh, with a more inclusive IVF mandates. Uh, it's already something that's benefiting uh, the residents of Illinois, uh, hopefully soon other places. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, advocacy reachable advocacy uh, uh, goals, including uh, expanding um, or allowing uh, the um, inclusion of uh, medical expenses and possibly others uh, in the context of surrogacy in deducting uh, in the in deductibility from uh, uh, the sample of IRS code, et cetera. So uh, we look forward to working with all of you on that. Uh, with your permission, we're gonna stay on for a few more minutes. We have some questions from the uh, participants and one of them 
revolves around something we also wanted to uh, to mention, and that is, once again, there is um, there are initiatives you're describing. Some of them explicitly mentioned uh, uh, having some internal surrogacy uh, agency, you know, capabilities, or uh, certainly uh, much more uh, developing your egg donation uh, services. And of course, you all have partners in these fields, uh, in these particular disciplines. I know that oftentimes it is done uh, concurrently. Uh, you have internal resource, but also work outside. But do you expect um, there to be perhaps frictions or, or issues with the desire sometimes to do verti vertical integration and take over your, uh, your partners in the, in the value chain? Not, not everybody together. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to go in your same order, but I do think um, there will be some vertical integration, but there's always, um, all ships rise with the tide. And I think that we have so many patients with so many different needs. Um, and, and so I think that what will happen is even when there is vertical integration, I think we'll still see that there is a huge need for our industry partners, um, partners from our agencies. And I think one of the questions is what are we looking for? And all of us, again, to bring these resources together. And I think we can do that um, in a multitude of ways. Um, but as you know, we said um, on the surrogacy side, we'll be expected to travel less with resources pulled, pooled, that becomes easier to deliver that kind of care. I think there's still some confusion or question about the logistics of an agency that works with you now. And um, as you uh, expand and have your own agencies and egg donor, and I, I think uh, Andrew mentioned, you're gonna have your, your ancillary surrogacy and egg freezing probe. Will that, I don't, for lack of a better word and not meant to be disrespectful, squeeze out um, the ability of the, the partners in the community, the industry partners that you've worked with over the years to continue to expect you to collaborate with them in the same, to the same extent. I think that's a fear. Michael, I, I'd like to address that. You know, I, I've been working with egg donor agencies and surrogacy agencies for the past 25 to 30 years, and these are long-standing relationships, and so they are not going to be tossed aside. That's just not who I am as a person. And I also think, to echo what Angie said, I think there's going to be a huge increase in demand for reproductive um, third-party cycles uh, over the next few years, in part due to the pandemic, but also part to change in so socialization of America. Um, young gay men are growing up knowing they can get married, they can have babies. This is not going backwards. And we're going to see a, a tremendous increase and one agency, one clinic, one network doesn't have enough resources to, to meet them all. So we need our industry partners to, to work with us to help our patients get pregnant. You know, uh, Michael, I would I would echo everything that was just said, right? I mean, I think there's going to be, a, there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of tailwinds uh, behind this industry in terms of the growth and demand dynamics of it. And at the same time, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of different business models, a lot of different strategies that, you know, various organizations are going to employ. But, I, you know, I think what I've heard certainly uh, across USF and even in, during this conversation is a, a lot of alignment and shared goal in terms of what are we trying to do, right? We're trying to help families. We're trying to help intended parents. We're trying to better outcomes and the clinical and patient experience, right? So I don't think anyone, I, I think all of this is intended uh, to, to, to help people and to, to continue to grow. Uh, and there are going to be differences, but, you know, I think it's all pointing in the right direction. And I, I just wanted to add too, and I know Ivy's not unique in this, and all of us are, are really investing in infrastructure to help support and facilitate these relationships, making it easier for our partners to work with us, um, making it easy for them to navigate these journeys with these clinics so that there is you know, access to information, um, making it so that our partners jobs are easier and their experiences are better. So you know, a lot of the investment that we're putting into our systems now are designed to help facilitate these relationships, not to, to, to eliminate them. You know, and if we're all successful, 
um, in growing the, the pie, we're all going to benefit from it. But, you know, hopefully um, through our efforts, we're going to make our partners' experiences better um, and our, our patients' outcomes better. And, um, and, you know, certainly not to dominate the world and eliminate the players by any means. Lisa's right, I, I'd like to echo is that if we have shared EMRs within each network, that's maybe not as many EMRs, that's no paper charts as much. And, um, and if that means then a partner uh, um, organization can then integrate better with our electronic system so that we're not faxing uh, from a 1986 technology uh, and, and hoping we found the right piece of paper, then it makes the patient experience go faster and smoother because all we want to do is get to that process faster. You know? And, and uh, one of the questions, and I think uh, uh, it, it relates to some of the things you said, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to put a focus on it since uh, we also share uh, a big passion in trying to remove financial barriers and make uh, this uh, at least counter the trend of uh, surrogacy becoming more and more and more expensive uh, by the minute. Uh, you mentioned possibly less travel, less bureaucracy, more coordination. Can you talk about uh, how do you think our uh, expenses uh, potentially going to be controlled, if maybe even reduced uh, through the efficiencies uh, or, or the locations, uh, the, the, the reach you have uh, with these new networks? Well, I think since you have similar practices that are aligned on the business side financially, it um, allows for you to be able to provide these package pricing without outside monitoring. And then if the patient is being seen in a California office and it's the same EMR, all I have to do is look up that patient. I can see the image quickly. So it saves on time and resources as well on the nursing side, and it makes things much faster and more and better quality. Some of us get faxed copies of an ultrasound and you're like, can't see whether the lining is good and things like that, or if the follicles are growing. So it can really, um, I think, improve the efficiencies of the business, which helps with cost too. Yeah, and I, I want to jump in and I can pick on these folks because they're not on the screen, I don't think. But, you know, we spend a lot of money um, on things like donor screening labs and pharmacy and medications and carrier testing. And, you know, when you're able to aggregate a network, you can negotiate those prices better. So our costs can go down, just our hard costs go down. And as a result, that, that'll be passed on to our patients. So, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity just from being able to to purchase purchasing power um, for the services that we don't provide internally. Anybody else? Uh, cost savings, uh, uh, passing those costs to the uh, patients uh, and uh, increasing efficiencies, or is it uh, something we exhausted? Uh, I think uh, we're coming down toward uh, the end of this uh, session. Uh, I one question that somebody asked is uh, why is the why is it that all these consolidations are happening at an accelerated pace uh, now? Uh, why now? In other words, um, uh, obviously it's something that uh, it's a perception that a lot of people have. I've heard from some people that they're asking what what took too long, what took so long. But uh, can you? Talk to us a little bit about the timing, or is it just is it something that people do when they're uh, cooped up uh, during COVID? Uh, what, what's uh, the meaning of all that? I think one of the things that has happened um, is a transition of the torch from the very first IVF centers, the first IVF doctors, and as they um, are exiting and retiring, then you have this uh, opportunity um, to pool resources and reconsider relationships. I think the other thing that's happened is if we consider the IVF laboratory a kitchen, the doors, there are multiple doors now that people enter to use that um, that care and that, that technology. And so um, as the world has thought about globalization and the um, and 
really um, seeing that in currency and finance and politics. I think you see it in medicine and in this field because it is quite, um, has a great opportunity for financial stability. I think that um, has brought in interest and resources. You know, Ron, I, I think there's a, actually a multitude of factors, right? Because, you know, um, I think we have certainly been um, amazed at the pace of that consolidation, particularly uh, uh, you know, the last 18 to 24 months that we've seen in the industry, right? I think there's, you know, both what I would characterize as a demand side and a supply side, the supply being capital, right? There is a lot of money looking for a return right now. So there have been a lot of uh, sponsor-backed and private equity-backed roll-ups, and that's not a pejorative, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, you know, that's certainly been one of the catalysts that I think has, you know, that has driven some of the activity in the space. I think another thing that's happening on the uh, on the supply on the side of the providers has been a clarity of the benefit of being part of a network uh, in terms of what the ability to care for your patients is, what the transitional uh, and sort of um, uh, uh, the benefits of it, both from a practice as you you know go through your career cycle, the benefits to your patients, um, and what it can do from an efficiency standpoint in terms of allowing you to focus on the practice of medicine. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the changing uh, things that we are as a specialty behind the curve across most of healthcare is, you know, we, uh, fertility continues to be a predominant, you know, compared to many specialties, cash-based, right? You know, self-pay based versus insurance-based. And as that payer shift happens, I think there's benefit, there are additional benefits on the provider side to being part of a larger group as opposed to part of a lot smaller independent. And that's, you know, I'm not passing any normative judgment about are these good or bad factors, but to answer the question, I think that those are the types of things in the mix that have driven a lot of the activity uh, investment consolidation wise. Interesting. Anybody else on, uh, because I think it's, uh, it's touching on other issues that are of interest, but uh, um, if not, I think uh, we went over the hour, we knew we might, and uh, this is obviously a very, uh, you know, complex issue and a, and a large group of people, but we absolutely appreciate your time and uh, willing to uh, set aside this uh, afternoon or uh, evening, uh, and uh, we hope to see you all at, uh, around, uh, you know, our events, our advocacy. Uh, we certainly will follow up uh, with opportunities for you to uh, become engaged and partner with us and others. We're often part of coalitions that are getting together to try to advance, uh, you know, causes like the ones I mentioned before, that uh, as Angie says, you know, rise, you know, all the ships are rising uh, with uh, lower access, uh, you know, with better access and lower costs. So um, uh, between that and increasing uh, standards, uh, better, more transparency about uh, ethical surrogacy standards. And, uh, and we look forward to collaborating with you about all of these. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity.